There we go. There. Now it's recording. All right. Y'all ready? Yep. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Cleaning Professionals Podcast. I'm Seth. And I'm Patrick. All right, Patrick. We got a special guest with us today. If I can talk, who is it? Yes, we do. We have Mr. Philip Wallman. Um, those of you that don't know Philip, he is from Manning, South Carolina, which is probably about three hours south of me and you, Seth. Seth's about 30 minutes north of me. Seth's right in Greensboro. And um, I've known Philip for a few years now. He's part of our Carolina group. Um, met him at Mikey's Fest. And uh, Philip, give us a little rundown about yourself. Tell us a little bit about Philip Wallman. Introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved in this business. Oh, okay. Well, like I said, my name's Philip. I've been cleaning carpet since I was born. Um, and it would take podcasts to go over uh, my history in the business. But the short story is uh, when, when my mom and dad got married, he was a senior in high school. And he went to work for a company uh, that drives a green van that everybody's heard of. And he did that for about six months. And then when I was born, he went and borrowed some money from some shady guys, uh, not mafia, but mafia-esque, and went and bought a, a portable extractor and a 175 and started what was known at that time as Chris's Cleaning. And, and so a lot like you guys, you know, my dad did this my entire life, but I guess the biggest difference is he never – stepped out and really made it into a business. My dad's a super smart guy and a hard worker, but he's just never really had the mentor or the education to really take that next step. He's always, you know, worked full time at different jobs and clean carpet. So I grew up, you know, cleaning carpet and stripping and waxing floors and I I hated it. And I always told myself, you know, I would never do this ever. Uh, you know, for a living. But, and so I thought I did the smart thing and went off to college. And when it really turned around is, you know, my freshman summer after college, I came home and my dad at the time was selling car wash chemicals. And so I took a couple of his chemicals and started a mobile car wash, a mobile detailing business that summer. And when I went back to school, my customers were steady calling and so my dad said, well, I'm not doing anything during the day. You know, I'll take it up and do that instead of selling chemicals. So that business grew into we now do have a car wash in town that my parents own. And, and this entire time, he was cleaning carpets as needed for a couple customers here and there. Uh, we bought a truck mount, our first truck mount, for the car wash. It was in a big, like, bread truck style truck and that was our mobile car wash truck and so about uh probably seven years ago now he had both of his knees replaced and he told me he said you know i you know i i just can't really get in and out the van and do the carpet cleaning up and down stairs and all this anymore and i was working full time uh but not making really as much money as i would like to have made so he said why don't you take the machine and see what you can do with it. So I took this old uh, 90s Pro Chem. Uh, it's called a Bear Cub XL. I don't know if y'all are familiar with it. So that, Heard of it. It's got like a 33 series blower. It's just a tiny machine. And we put that in the back of a trailer, a little 5 by 8 retired U-Haul trailer. And I can remember that first year, that like, I can look back in, at my records and that February and March, I did one job those two months, just did one job. <laughs> but but somehow that first summer, uh, I picked up the local school district. And for me, you know, that was huge. That was like a $6,000, $7,000 job. And I did the whole thing out that little trailer uh, with an 11-inch Pro Chem stainless wand, no glide. And, <laughs> and I, it had to be 50 classrooms. Um, and at that point, I, I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I think I kind of enjoy this. I never thought I would, but I think I kind of enjoy this. I think we can grow this, but I can't do it with this equipment anymore. So, we, we you know, we need to make a decision to either kind of invest a little bit and make it happen or just, 
just give it up. Uh, and at that point, I actually I bought a Ford van and went down to a, uh, TCS in Atlanta, and they had a return machine. That, I don't know if it came off lease or something, a little Warrior, which ain't much of an upgrade, but uh, but it, it did have heat and suction and, and a van. So for me, it was a huge upgrade. And we ran that for about a year. And business just, uh, you know, slowly grew. Now, you know, there'd be weeks where I didn't have a job, you know, and then there'd be weeks where we had a job every evening. And I was always doing just the one job a day. In the evening, I'd get off of work and come home, change clothes, and go clean. And I was on my own. And, you know, Logan didn't, you know, my son helps now a lot. But at the time, he didn't show any interest, which he was 13 years old at the time. Felicia didn't show in any interest at all. My wife, who helps us out all the time now, she didn't show any interest at all. But that's how that's how we started. Yeah, second generation wow. um, hand me down. That's cool. So you're just like you're like me and Seth. We're both both second generation. We just grew up in it, and uh, growing up in it is funny because me and Seth both have said the same thing. We've both said we swore we wouldn't do it. We hated it because you grow up doing it, and I was like just burn out on it and I did it so much. And then it's like something just sucks you back in, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, you know, I think the biggest, and I'll say this because anybody that hears this needs to know the biggest mistake my dad get, did growing up and two mistakes that really drove me away from the business is he never, he never really charged enough. And I think it's because he always looked at it as, I wouldn't pay that much. I would only pay this much. And and, he, and at the same time, he had that idea that most employees have, most people that go to work to the, for the man have, is, uh, you know, I can go clean this carpet and charge, you know, 80 bucks, and it, it takes me an hour. That's $80 an hour. That's 10 times what I'm making, you yeah. know, at work. And that's two mistakes I think he made that really prevented the business from taking off even back then. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's something we've talked about too, with guys not understanding the, their numbers and not understanding profit and what it costs to make that money. And there's so many people that come out of an hourly job and they really think that if they, if they go out and they make $200 in a day, that's killer. I mean, for some people, they say, man, I, they've never made $200 in a day. So, so yeah, that I mean, you're you're absolutely right there. So tell us, Philip. You know, your your wife is involved. I knew she worked. She's a very hard worker, by the way. Because one thing I remember, <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I remember about Mikey's Fest was uh, it's the first time I ever met you guys. But uh, we were doing a lot of tile and grout, and uh, you know, most guys don't want to go around and get edges. Uh, we, and me and Felicia were going around underneath the countertops and. And she was working like crazy with me scrubbing. I was like, wow, this, this chick really knows how to work. You know, so <laughs> Felicia, tell us how was she involved and now is she full-time in the business part-time? Well, so about three and a half years ago, she, she worked full-time for a doctor's office. Uh, and she, she enjoyed the patients. She enjoyed the, the, you know, the doctor and the nurses. But the, the office got bought out by a local hospital system. And she really got run down with the bureaucracy of it all. And she really didn't make much money. And so I, t I told her then, I said, listen, you know, the, the business is, is growing steadily. I can't answer the phone. When I'm at work, you know, I can't, you know, I can't pick up the phone for the business. I said, just, just quit. Just go. Even if you just answer the phone, you're going to make up the income you've lost, you know, almost immediately. I said, you spend one or two days a week, you know, go out and drum up some business, talk to the local businesses, get our name out there, and and that's going to change. That's going to easily replace the income we've lost. And it took a little convincing, but she did. She did finally quit that. And and really, Mikey's Fest was a turning point, really, for her and for her business because, you know, I grew up in it, so I, I knew carpet cleaning, but she didn't really know anything about the business and she didn't really know that there was this whole community out there you know that there were other guys just like us and and i think she really grew to appreciate that what we were doing 
you know, may seem, you know, to some people it seems, you know, mundane or, or uh, you know, people kind of, I don't want to say look down on you, but, but really it seems like a dirty job. And I think she realized that there's a lot of, there's a lot of respect and a lot of effort that goes into this. Uh, so yeah, that, that Mikey Fest in Greenville that you're talking about was, that was really a turning point for her. She got to meet other people that were in this same thing and, and she did. She worked her tail off. We actually won. Well, she won. I didn't have anything to do with it. That hard, They gave it to her for being the hardest working, like a Sager spotter's bag from Harvard. Yeah. And we, we still use that bag in the van today. I think all the chemicals have been rotated through. But, but yeah, she, that really turned her on to the business. So now she, we, she, the company does pay her hourly. Um she, there's no way that she actually captures every hour she works, but but that way she gets a W-2 and she's paying some taxes and, and paying into to Social Security and all. And so she averages billing out about 20 hours a week on the business. But that, that also gives her the freedom, you know, for the past few years, you know, with kids in school and they're all playing sports and and that's given her the freedom during the day to, you know, run to the schoolhouse or go to tennis games or or soccer games and all that. So it's really freed us up for that. So she she loves it now. She didn't like it to start with. And and for you guys that are on the Facebook groups and all, she's really taken up taken over she'll she'll run a wand in a heartbeat. But what she really excels at is the the customer focus of it. She can talk to anybody, and it's hard to tell with me when I get on here on YouTube or all. I might seem like an outgoing guy, but I am an extreme introvert. I cannot talk to people like in person. I have a hard time with customers, and that's the one thing she excels at. And it's the one thing my younger guys like o- Logan and Austin that help me out. They're not good at it. So. Up till, you know, here coming up soon, during the day, she could take them and started knocking out one, two jobs during the day. Uh, and she handles the customers and kind of supervises the guys, and they do a terrific job. Um, and that has really opened us up. So, yeah, she's a, she's a very important part of the business, even though she may hate it. Wow. Cool. Seth, I don't want to hog Philip with all the questions. What you what you got? You got some questions for him? Yeah, you may have mentioned I got two questions, but how old did you say your business was? So, um, actual CNN cleaning services, which is a business that since I've taken it over, uh, I've been doing it for seven years, about seven okay. years now. Okay. Um, and, and we, we said, actually uh, started. Go ahead. I'm People ask where the CNN came from, but our car wash that we have in town, my parents run, is CNN Car Wash. And we've had that now, the the physical building car wash, for about 10 years. And so when I took over, I was like, well, people are familiar with that. You know, that's how we got started. So, yeah, seven, maybe seven and a half years now. So okay. what's, what's the, I'm sorry, Seth, I, 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 no, told I, talk, I told you to talk and then I cut you off, but I got to ask this before we get, so the C is the, what's the N, Chris and? My, my mother's name is Nancy. So okay. Chris and okay. Nancy. Yep. yep. So that's okay. where it comes from. We pick up some of that multi-generational idea and, you know, I get people ask me all the time, what's my affiliation with the car wash? And well, you know, my parents run that for, for now. Yeah. All right. The second question I was going to ask, and you mentioned your YouTube channel. What is the name of it, and uh, how long have you been on there? Uh, so the YouTube is CNN Cleaning Services, um, and I started that out kind of as a hobby. And, and I'm not a huge YouTube celebrity, you know, like like some of those guys, like Courtney or Miles or somebody that's just really taking that to the next level. But I, I have fun with it. Um, I'm floating around. You know, I'll probably hit the thousand subscriber mark this year, maybe if I'm lucky. No, um, get, they're and, getting paid now. Yeah, but but where I see it, where I see it at is I, I've always felt like if you have the ability to help somebody, then it it becomes your responsibility. So mm-hmm. I try to use it as a tool, and I get people 
it, you know, they ask me questions all the time. I try to put up, you know, repair tips or carpet cleaning tips. But also more than that, what you'll see more now going forward is getting into the business growth uh, and and some business coaching stuff because, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, for me coming into this business, I, I've act, I'm actually got an MBA. I'm, you know, I've got a master's degree in operations management. So there's a lot of the the business aspect of things that I understand better than probably better than the average carpet cleaner. Uh, so that's kind of my goal is to use that more towards the advancement of of people's business not even necessarily related to carpet cleaning that just happens to be what we do to get there yeah cool yeah i mean that's the thing there's so many people so many guys out there that are cleaning that you know they can't get it to the next level just because they don't have the mind for it they've never been taught they've never you know so people can use those tips because you know when it comes to this industry I mean, there's a ton out there for, this is one thing me and Seth have noticed is there's a ton out there for the actual uh, knowledge about the process. And, and you can find out a lot about, you know, what chemicals to use and what tools and what procedures. But then when it really comes to, okay, how do we manage, how do you manage your business? What are some of the strategies? What, what about marketing? What about employees? What about all these things? That's where, I mean, there's some of that out there a little bit, but nowhere near as much as there is of the other. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, there tends to be two two kind of channels for carpet cleaning or cleaning in general on YouTube. You have the, the Courtney Lees and the Miles uh, with, and Miles Mays, which just, they appeal to the customer and, and, and they've just exploded. And it's just crazy how many people love to sit down and watch people clean carpet and wash rugs. And then you have the guys like uh, like Yeeter or somebody, or even Mark Sager, whose videos more appeal towards the carpet cleaners. Cleaner, right. And, and that's good. They're doing a great job as well, and that's good and all, too. But, but yeah, I, I kind of see a niche more for not just carpet cleaners, uh, but more for business, small business in general. Uh, you know, along the same lines, I'm trying to get started here in my hometown kind of a get together, a meetup of small businesses, those guys that have, you know, five employees or three employees or less or want to be. And you miss so many things at that size. You're not big enough sometimes to to spend tons of money with a CPA and a lawyer to make sure you have everything in line, but you're missing out on so many opportunities because you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask you too is you talked about your business has grown grown quite a quite a bit since you started it. How have you gotten those customers and how have you retained them? Uh, that's a great question. So, um, I don't spend I, I spend less than five hundred dollars a year in advertisement, and most of that is in the form of uh, we sponsor our local school sports team. So we have the signs on the sports field and things like that. Things that in themselves don't necessarily generate customers, right? You do it so people kind of recognize your name, but, but nobody's sitting at a high school football game and saying, that's the guy I'm going to call. Yeah. Most of my customers come from word of mouth. And um, like I shared on the Facebook page the other day, I get one person in, in our town that says, hey, I'm looking for a carpet cleaner. And 10, 15, 20 people immediately respond, recommending me. And it's taken a long time to develop that reputation. Uh, but I live in a pretty rural area. I, the county I service only has about 35,000 people. And everybody knows everybody. And, and because I was working all this time and, and carpet cleaning wasn't my sole income, I had the ability to take my time and slowly grow that customer base. I wasn't out there trying to trying to run a bunch of specials to get my name out there real quick. You know, I just make sure that every customer that we service is completely happy so that when their neighbor asks them, hey, who was that guy, you know, that cleaned your carpet? I want them to know without a doubt that it was me. Uh, and we... We have, I am fortunate in a way that there's there's not a lot of 
competition where I'm at. Um, the, there's a few guys, honestly, I've tried to reach out to them because I try to be just like the two of y'all that really share a market, but yet you get along great. I try to get along with the guys in my market, and a lot of them just kind of just kind of throw you off to the side. They don't really want to have anything to do with you. And, and I, you know, I'm there to help anybody. But, uh, but, yeah, all of my customers now, we've grown really just very slowly. Like I said, the first year we'd go weeks without a job. But when people request, hey, hey who can help me with a carpet cleaner, I want everybody to know that, that we are the solid choice. And so far that's worked out real well for me. That's good. And you're, you know, that's common what you described about the cl other cleaners. And, you know, most, I have a relationship with a few cleaners in my area. Seth's one of them, but the majority of cleaners, and I've said this before on the podcast, and I've made videos before, live videos before where I've talked about it, how important it is to network with other cleaners in the Carolina group. But the truth is most people do not out of fear, out of, uh, whatever, you know, there's a, a, a lot of reasons. Sometimes they're worried that, you know, you're going to try to take their customers or they're worried that they're not going to know as much as you, or sometimes it's just flat out animosity. I mean, it's like, that's common. Most people you reach out to that are other cleaners, they just don't, I, I don't know why cleaners are like that, but they just are. I mean, it's a real competitive thing. The mindset is wrong. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really common. So let me ask you this, like, as far as your area, um, I know you said it's pretty, pretty rural, pretty small. Do you, um, like, do you ever see yourself going into, is there an adjacent area maybe that you would see yourself going into to continue to grow or try to seek out a certain type of customer? Cause I know like you're really wanting to get into and you're getting into, which we'll get into that later with the rugs, with your rug setup, which is, I mean, I think you've done an amazing job with your rug setup, do you, is there another market you feel like you might have to go to, to seek out those type of rugs eventually? Yeah. So I guess to answer that question, I, I should back up a little and say, first off, because we mentioned it before we started the actual recording, but uh, so by the time everybody sees this podcast, I will no longer be what I call a bivocational cleaner. I won't have the full-time job. Um, I'll still be working out some notice and all, but actually, uh, you know, the, where I sit at, I don't have anybody that re, that I report to, and my boss is coming in actually tomorrow. When you know we're recording this today, you know, before you hear it, obviously. But so by the time you hear this, I will have putting in my notice on my full time job, which means I need to make that step pretty quick from going, you know. Right now, it's perfectly okay if we don't have a job scheduled this week, which which we do. We you know we've been blessed to stay extremely busy, even busier than I'd like. But now I have to fill those books. Uh, so we have a town that I don't currently service much of, that's much bigger than where we live. That I try to stay within 20 miles, and I can service most of this town at 25 or 28 miles. Uh, so right off the bat, what we're going to do is I'm going to heavily market to them just in Facebook posts and things like that, you know, relatively inexpensive, just boost, you know, my name over there some and try to grow that, you know, start out one day a week, we schedule some jobs over there. So that's how we're going to build the, the carpet cleaning business, because I think we will reach a cap in our area of that ideal customer. And I'm not willing to lower my prices to capture some more customers or or change my processes to capture others, I would rather go out another 10 miles a couple of days a week and pick those up. Uh, but then you mentioned the rugs, and the rugs is kind of a different strategy for me. Uh, and we can talk about the rug shop some more, but the rug marketing part is where I'm located. Uh, it, we are in the middle of nowhere, but we're also – very much in the middle of everywhere. We are in exactly an hour drive from Columbia, from Charleston, from Myrtle Beach, and from Florence. So basically the four biggest cities in South Carolina, with the exception of Greenville, you know, we're an hour from. Right. So we're basically perfectly set up for, for a, a good route for the rug stop. And that's kind of the route I want to go is to have, you know, have a van dedicated to just, 
build up relationships with cleaners in that area, and then one day a week go out and pick up rugs and, and bring rugs back. So that's kind of the goal for that. The, um, because our area, we will hit the ceiling for the rug shop very, very quickly. It's just a, it's a reasonably low income area. There's just not too many customers out there uh, for the rugs. Yeah, and, that, you know, and that's, in, that's kind of that's kind of what I was getting at. And, and first off, congratulations on taking that step because that's huge. I mean, that's a that's a huge step to make. That's a huge step for you guys. And I, I mean, I'm I'm super happy for you. Uh, that's awesome. Um, but that's kind of what I and and we're so I you know Ashboro, our actual town we live in, the, the city of Ashboro is is about twenty five thirty thousand people. But we're kind of like you. We're right in the Piedmont. We're situated, you know, Greensboro, Winston Salem. We have Pinehurst to our south, which is a big, huge Oriental rug. It's, it's our best area for for higher end rugs. But you know, it's, it's we're in the same. And that's kind of what I was saying is, you know, you're going to have to go somewhere else to get you know fine rugs in Man in Manning. You know, and that's not yeah. not. I'm in the same boat. I mean, my little town. If we just if I if we said we're not going to leave Ashboro to wash rugs we wouldn't wash very many rugs you know what i mean and that's kind of what i was that's kind of what i was i was thinking you probably had some kind of plan and you're right you're and my dad said that before he said uh well you know he said you know phillips in a perfect spot he said if you think about where he's got right around him he said you know he can hit you know this far he can hit charleston myrtle beach he said that same thing so you're you're right and that's pretty much we go on a regular basis an hour in any in any given direction, wherever we really need to go, uh, so that's that's cool. I'm gl I'm glad you got that in the works. You've got that plan. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's what we're hoping to do, and, and uh, it's going to take a little time. Yeah, I've been slowly. The rug shop has been slow to grow, um, mostly because it, it's been exactly a year, and I know that because since we opened the physical location, I've done rugs in my garage for quite some time. But since we signed the building lease and all, I know that because I just had to re-sign the lease this month. So it's been exactly a year that we opened up a business in the middle of, of COVID uh, with, without really knowing how it was going to go. Uh, but one of the benefits of a fairly rural area in the middle of a pandemic is there's not a lot of demand for those co commercial buildings. So. I feel like we got a good price on the rent, and I knew it would be covered just, you know, just washing a few rugs. Uh, so we took we took that leap, and the way it was supposed to work out is Felicia would be able to spend most of her day there at the shop and start picking up that that off the street traffic and slowly growing that business. You know, Manon's not a huge town, but what we do have is a pretty big population of retirees. Uh, because we got the lake community and all, and we're almost exactly halfway down the coast of Florida. So some of them like stop here at the lake, and they just never seem to go any further. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've been uh, we've been getting there on that, and now of course with more time to devote to that, uh, I think we're going to really see it take off. But I mean the bottom the bottom line for the rug shop is you know. You don't hear people say, I absolutely love carpet. You know, I, I love cleaning carpet. Yeah, I like seeing a before and after. I enjoy interacting with the customers. But I really love rugs. I really appreciate the history and the construction and, and all that goes into them, the story they tell. Uh, so I would like to eventually be uh, to a point where I spend more time in the rug shop than out on the van and then slowly bring in and train technicians to take over the carpet cleaning and and make the carpet cleaning more of a tool to bring in rugs more than the other way around. So cool. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Where do you um where do you see yourself in your business in five years from now? And you kinda of already sort of answered that, but I'll let you <laughs> further elaborate. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I have a book that I, I finished reading about a month ago called Vivid Vision, and I, I don't remember the author of it, but uh, it was recommended on a podcast I was listening to. And if any of you, uh, I, I would I would tell any business owner you should read that book because the the way it works is you really detail out where you want to be in five years, and you don't do as as oh I'd like to have this, I'd like to have that. You basically 
immerse yourself in what you will be in the future. And and people take it so far as to print out newspaper articles and stuff in, in the future. So I've thought about this a lot. And and really, I where I will be, I won't even say I want to be, where I will be in five years or less is we'll have we'll have the rug shop running, you know, full time. Uh, hopefully at that point, maybe even enlarged uh, from where our current location, but at least full time processing rugs. And then three carpet vans w with my hope to have two full time technicians on a van every day, 40 hours a week, and then the third van in the rotation as needed, whether it be me that jump on there or or a breakdown or anything like that. So that's where I, I'll be, uh, you know, in five years. And we, you know, I see, I see that two to three vans being the tipping point where we're really able to reach out into the neighboring markets and start taking those over, and then still being able to devote enough time to the rug shop. And and then there's another kind of aspect we haven't talked about is uh, I kind of accidentally uh, became the the dealer or the representative in the U.S. for the uh, Turkish machines that I use. Uh, and so that'll be a big part of our business, especially in the next year, if the logistics of getting stuff overseas would settle down a little bit. Um, you know, I import those centrifuges and dusting machines and washing machines. And I've, and I've done a few this year, but I really want to grow that side of the business as well um, because it's you know, it's a, it's a nice little – I don't make a ton of money at it, but it's a nice way to help rug yeah. cleaners get on their feet and build a shop out uh, with – you know, they're, obviously, if you got the money, you want to go buy an American machine from, you know, Tom Monahan or somebody like that built in this country. But the fact is, when you're first starting a rug shop, you can't necessarily do that. I know I couldn't. Uh, so there are alternatives besides buying – a you know, a Chinese machine that you run for a year and then it tears up. Yeah. Five years, that's where we'll be. That's cool, man. I think that's cool how you're how you're doing the machines. I remember you posting that and um yeah, I mean if you can help somebody help somebody else out get some, some equipment, that that's what it's all about. So tell us a little bit about the rug setup that you have now currently. Like just kinda for the guys that have not, I, you know, I've kind of seen it in some of the videos, but for people that hadn't seen your shop, just kind of paint a visual picture for them of how, how you how you bring them in and process and the equipment you have. Okay. So, uh, you know, we, we, we lease a building in basically a strip mall. So, so we didn't have the luxury of a lot of floor drains and, 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 and a garage door and all that stuff you would want on your wish list, but we're right downtown in town among all the little boutiques and, and stuff like that where the higher end clientele tend to spend their time. Uh, so it's 20, 2,400 foot. It's just a long building, 24 feet wide, 100 feet long. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have the luxury of building a wash pit, I bought a Versa wash pit, uh, which is the like the plastic liner with the risers, and, and run that through a sump pump. And then I have a, an automatic bed duster that's a ten foot, ten and a half foot wide bed duster, and a and a and a ten and a half foot long centrifuge. And then of course we have a smaller manual duster for the bigger rug. Uh, but the process kind of works as, you know, much like anybody on a smaller scale. We bring in the rugs, we take pictures, do a good inspection, dust it. You know, if it needs a, you know, a pet treatment or something like that, it gets done and then washed and then, uh, you know, spun in the centrifuge. And right now what my shop lacks actually is I don't have a drying room set up. Uh, and it's not because we don't have the space. Is that right now we haven't had the huge amount of rugs coming through where it was a requirement, and I just haven't had the time to do it. Yeah. <laughs> So we right now we're spinning everything and basically drying flat on the Versa wash floor, which works well because they you get a lot of airflow under that floor right. as well. So it's still, it's, it's it's especially being where you're at this time of year. It's probably it's probably like especially when uh, on the wool rugs and stuff because I know you do so, you probably do some synthetics too, but on 
probably on the thicker wool rugs with the humidity and everything is probably what's your how long does it take you to actually get one dry not not very long at all one of one of the benefits of being in that strip mall is our entire building is climate controlled okay uh, okay so we, I, didn't we realize, I was that. i was thinking it, it was yeah i was like man that's got to be yeah, tough so we're working in the air conditioner all day long so we oh keep man it. that's awesome <laughs> yeah it's nice uh, but we also have a dehumidifier running in the shop all the time. So we keep oh, right. a humidity level in the shop of 50 degrees or 50% humidity. And and normally the shop stays, you know, 70, 75, normal air conditioner temp. And then if we have a lot of rugs to dry, then I can either cut on the heat, we can heat the whole building and still run the dehumidifier, or I can I have a smaller room that will eventually become the drying room that I can run a heater in and the dehumidifier. Gotcha. But uh, normally, if we if we wash a floor full of rugs today, run the dehumidifier and air conditioner, get the humidity out, after the centrifuge, you know, there's not a whole lot of moisture left. When we come in the next day, they're good to go. That's awesome. See, I didn't realize that your whole space was, it was uh, you know, was, uh, had you had uh, your AC, you know, and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's huge there, man, for sure. I was thinking yeah, when nice. I saw it in the back, I was thinking it was probably, you know, uh, no temperature control in the space. And I thought, I know that that's that's hard whenever, because especially this time of year in the south, you know, the humidity is just, oh, oh man, yeah. We've seen this, this week, I don't know about you guys, you're a little further north, but this week we were pegging at 104, 105 degrees during the day. Uh -huh. And the humidity levels are sometimes, you might see 80% humidity. So yeah. it is, it's just crazy hot. So it's really nice when you get a rug day where you can work in that shop. Yeah. That's it. I used to have a buddy, he was a painter and he would, uh, he went all over the, the state and, uh, and North Carolina, well, really all over the country. And he had the, uh, he had a contract to paint all the tractor supplies. And he used to always tell me the lowland in South Carolina was the hottest place on earth. That's what he used to say. <laughs> He used to I'm, tell me, he would I'm say, man. everywhere I've been, he said, I've been all over this country painting. And he said, I'm telling you, he said, because he was like in Florence or somewhere. He said, that's the hottest place on the face of the earth, just because I mean, it's just the humidity. Yeah, we we have some family down in Florida, and they always talk about how hot it is, you know, down there. And they'll come up here, and, and they just can't handle it. And and I tell them, you know, we're just, we're just far enough off the coast. We don't get the luxury of a sea breeze. Yeah. We just got huge humidity, and I mean, you're soaking wet when you walk out the door. But. Yeah. Wow. Seth, you got any more questions for Philip? Yeah, I got a couple of uh, just kind of off the off the wall kind of questions. One is, uh, you kind of already mentioned one book you read, but any other books you uh, you're reading now, or you recommend for our listeners to pick up and read? Sure. Um, well, definitely. Like I said, the vivid vision. I wish I knew the author. And then another one I always recommend to any entrepreneurs is the E Myth. The E Myth Revisited um, is a great, just all around business book to, to take you out of that mindset, like we talked about earlier. Of I just I just made eighty dollars this hour, so you know, it really makes you step aside and realize that that probably eighty percent of carpet cleaners don't own a business, right? They just own a job. Mm -hmm. And so that book, that book will really put you in that frame of mind on how to get out of that. And what about a podcast? What podcast you listen to? I, I have recently been, well, of course, I listen to the Cleaning Professionals podcast every week. I, <laughs> nice. yeah, I told I told y'all before we started, I, I really do enjoy this podcast. It's something our industry needs. But I've also listened, I listen to a lot of real estate uh, podcasts um, from Bigger Pockets uh, Real Estate, um, which is actually, you know, I don't currently uh, invest a lot in real estate, although that's coming, but that's where I get a ton of my just general business ideas and inspiration ideas from is those guys, because those real estate guys, they just always go hard 100%. So uh, I've been listening to a lot of Bigger Pockets podcast um you know i spend i spend about an hour and a half a day just driving back and forth to work and that's all i do is listen to podcasts and 
Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's pretty much the biggest one, you know. There's, there's several more little ones out there to different TED talks and stuff like that. But but yeah, you guys are the most important one by far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how is Felicia with the jump and everything? Like, is she is she pretty cool about it? Is she nervous about it? Is she like, I mean, how, what's what's the atmosphere like? Well, if she's nervous about it, she hadn't said. Uh, but what she told me, I, and it's pretty recent development. Like I said, I never really planned to leave my full-time job of my own accord because I mentioned I'm in research and development, and what normally happens is you'll get a company direction change, and they'll decide that you're not really of benefit anymore, and they offer you a, a settlement package, and you go away. And so for the past three or four years, I've just not really loved my job. And I've really just been working till that day comes, you know, till they decide that I'm no longer wanted. But I came home probably three or four weeks ago and I told Felicia, I said, listen, I can't, I can't do it anymore. It's got to change. I said, I'm, I'm miserable. I'm unhealthy because I'm just not taking care of myself very well. I'm spending seven or eight hours behind a desk wasting time when I just know that if I was to spend that seven or eight hours developing our business, just, you know, I've been averaging 15 hours a week and we've grown to the point we're at. Just imagine if I invested 40 hours a week, you know, what our trajectory would look at. And she told me, you know, when I, when I wanted to leave my job, you told me if you're not happy, it's time to go and we'll make it happen. So she seems supportive of it. And, I think what what really made her feel better is we went a, we went a couple of weeks ago and talked to a CPA about making sure everything was outlined right for the business and taxes and all, and he actually sounded pretty excited about it. And I think that made her realize that it might be the right step to take. Because she was, of course, she's worried. I'm scared to death, to be honest with you. But you know, what's the the I always look at what is the worst possible outcome, and the worst possible outcome is I'm just going to have to go get a job I don't like. I mean, yeah, that wouldn't be any different than I am now. So instead of investing all that time and growing somebody else's business, it's time for me to, you know, give it a shot and invest that time to grow my own business. And, you know, we're not starting out from zero. I, I have enough of a runway where we're going to know, you know, whether it's going to be enough or not before we're homeless. So that's the important thing, I think. Yeah, I got I got all the confidence in the world in you, man. I think it's cool. I think it's awesome. And and you know, you're right. I mean, sometimes you you just have to look at it just like you did. And it's like a buddy of mine told me one time. He said, "When's the last time?" He said, to "Really think about when's the last time you really applied yourself for something and really went all in on it and failed." And I got to thinking about it. You know what I mean? I thought, you know, there's there, you know. I mean, there's been very few things, the times in my life where I think, man, I really, if I really want something and I really went after it and I couldn't achieve it, you know, so I think, I think you're going to do great. Man, it's great timing for you uh, coming on the podcast because uh, up until five minutes before this podcast, me and Seth had no idea that you were making that jump. So I think that's, that's really, really cool. And uh, I wish you all the success. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I wasn't going to let you let that uh, come out today, uh, but I think the podcast is timed out right because I plan to, uh, like I say, I plan to basically put in my notice tomorrow, the day after we record this, the day before anybody hears it, and I'll be doing a video uh, for YouTube. At some point this week, it'll come out, and that'll be kind of be the opening of, you know, the direction that the business is going and and what's going on and of course beg people to hit that subscribe button so we can try to get that word out there a little bit well if you want to uh beth could, could send you the link when we get it finished up probably later on tomorrow and you can just forward it to your boss and just say hey man listen to this <laughs> <laughs> uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't do her like that and i say one one of the things that i i am going to miss is i i do like the people that i work with uh, you know, and I like what I do. I like the people I work with. I just don't like who I do it for anymore. So time to make a change. That's cool. Seth, you got anything else for Mr. Phillips? 
Yeah, I thought about asking him. You know, we used to have a segment, uh, tools we're loving right now, but Patrick fails to remind me to do that all the time. So, <laughs> what tools yeah, are you liking that you're really into right now? Well, I think the 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 default answer for me really has to be the zipper. You know, we, we you know we have a zipper SS now that it really changed the way we do commercial carpet. And the example, if if you watch our last YouTube video. That came out the other day. We do some hallways in a big apartment building, and that zipper basically made it as fast to do hot water extraction as as we could have done it low moisture. So that's probably one of my favorite tools right now. And I know they've been out some time now, but but it's it's really revolutionary uh, to our business for hot water extraction. And and that's coming from a guy. I have a big 32 inch drag wand. You know, and I and I have the I have the 11 inch you know Procan stainless one. So I've I've been around uh, extraction for a long time, and that really is a, a turning point in our business. That's good. Yeah. And plus, Eric Hiltz is just a great guy. If you ever had the opportunity to talk to him, so I like to support those. I really like to support those guys in our industry, like Eric or like Mark or like you guys or even Mikey that. Uh, that really care about you know our industry and the cleaners not just out there to make a buck yeah mm-hmm. I, I i don't understand when i see people because i'm the same way with the zipper one i mean seth can tell you if anybody that knows me i'm like the biggest fan and uh when people tell me they don't like them i just especially if it's somebody that i really like respect as a cleaner it's hard like if it's somebody that i don't really know or i just think they're a goober i'll be like okay i'll just but if it's somebody like i got this one guy buddy of mine and he's like he just hates it and i just cannot wrap my <laughs> brain around that i'm like how could you not like it like what are you missing it's no so, way i don't get it i mean i just don't i mean to me if you ask me like what it's probably one of the most, if not the most innovative tool probably to come out in the last, you know, 20 years. And I, I don't, I mean, it just like you said, especially big open areas. And I understand if you, if you mainly do residential and you do very little large open spaces, but big open commercial is just such a game changer, at least for us, you know? Yeah. And we do, we're probably half and half commercial and residential, but the commercial that we do is, nasty you know i do a a fried chicken restaurant every month and that zipper has just changed it where we can we knock out you know we do the before covid we did it every month now we do the carpet every other month and the tile every other carpet cleaning and we got to where now logan and i can go in there when they close at 10 o'clock and be walking out the door at 11 and it's all because of that zipper uh, so it's really changed, you know, really changed the way we do commercial business. And I, I go back to remember, you know, when we started out working those classrooms with an 11 inch wand and, and going home at the end of the day and icing my shoulders and sitting in a hot bathtub just so I can get up the next day and do it over again. And, and you know, we've done those, those schools recently and it takes about 20 minutes per classroom. Yeah. <laughs> a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, one other thing that I forgot to talk about, I forgot to mention. So you have, is it an Aerotech or a Vortex? I have a Vortex um, and that it actually caught the coronavirus. Uh, <laughs> in October of last year, the transmission went out in the Vortex and we took it to a transmission shop to have it rebuilt. And because of the pandemic, they have been unable to get one of the parts that they had to be able to get. So we actually went and bought a butler. I call it the baby butler in our videos. It's a 99, it's an older unit. We bought, we actually drove up to Delaware and bought it pretty much Mm -hmm. sight unseen and drove it home and put it to work the next day. And the goal was use it for two or three weeks. We'll get the Vortex back. We'll be able to kind of park it and use it as a backup piece of equipment. Well, the Vortex is still sitting in that same transmission shop, still waiting for parts from COVID, and the butler has been running every single day nonstop. So 
I, I got a hand into it. I, I never expected it to hold up as well as it does. But, of course, one of the things we're going to do here in the next few weeks as things get settled out is I'm going to have to make an investment in the big truck. I've been putting off uh, buying a new transmission. Uh, it's just so much money, but I think I'm just going to have to and get the big truck back uh, and then give the butler the attention it, it it really needs and probably still keep it for a backup truck. But it's worked well, out well. Come, how did you come across the Vortex? How long had you had that? Because that was the only thing, because I think – as long as I've known you, that's what you are always running. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I guess it's been five years ago. So I, I ran the TCS unit for about a year, and it just really wasn't big enough for some of the commercial jobs we were doing. Like, the, you know, I got the school's contract every year, which was just that we had, you know, 400-foot hose runs at times. Um, so, and I just browsing around on the forums and the board, I ran into a couple guys, uh, like the Rampages out in the Midwest or Lee Letchworth that's in Charlotte. And I start seeing them build their business model around that big truck, you know, and, and how, how, just how appealing it is to see that guy pull up in that monster truck with, that you can just tell how powerful it was. So I was kind of looking around for one. At the same time, California's new diesel regulations were taking place, and it was going to become prohibitively expensive to keep a diesel truck on the road, uh, you know, unless it was built after, I think, 2010 and had the, de the DEF and all that, you know, which mine doesn't. So we found a, a, the Vortex for sale out in Palm Desert, California, actually from a couple that has a, a very, very nice rug washing studio out there, um, which is really where I first got interested in, in rug washing as well. But their son ran the carpet cleaning. He had the Vortex, and he decided he was going to basically take off in an RV and travel the country. So they were selling the Vortex. They couldn't keep it registered in California anymore anyway. So Felicia and I flew out there picked it up and drove it home 3,200 some odd miles from Palm Desert, California to our driveway uh, in like four days. It took us four days because that thing topped out on the interstate about 65 miles an hour. And, and it, and, you know, I got home and couldn't walk for two days, but it was, it, I love that truck. I really do love that truck. And, and when you pull into a customer's house, with that truck and you roll that door up and, and you can just tell that, that it's somebody that cares about their equipment, you know, even though that's, that's an older truck. Now that's a 2007 truck. So e even at that age, it's still, it's pretty intimidating and it's nice to run, you know, dual wands out to three, 400 feet with no problems. So that's, right. you know, that's been real beneficial to us. If I can only get the poor thing back, Hopefully, yeah. hopefully pretty soon. Yeah, I bet. That's, that's what I'm saying. I can't imagine going, um, you know, from having all that capability. I know you're probably missing having all that capability, especially like on the big commercial stuff. Yeah, it, it has been a blessing in disguise, though, because Felicia or Logan could never drive the big truck. Yeah. Uh, and so now that they're taking it out and doing jobs during the day, we'd have never gotten there if I hadn't broke down and bought that butler in, in an emergency situation. So yeah, everything worked out to, to the good, but it, it was, it's definitely been a change for us. Awesome. Seth, you got any other questions before we, we wrap it up? No, I think that's it, man. I appreciate you, Philip, coming on. Oh, no problem. I appreciate it. Like I said, I love what you guys are doing. Love listening to the podcast. Uh, and if I can ever do anything for you or anybody that listens, just just give me a shout. Yeah, give us the name of your uh, YouTube channel one more time. All right. If you go to YouTube and look for CNN Cleaning Services, uh, we'll pop right up. I don't uh, I don't know how YouTube formats it. Slash CNN Cleaning Services. I think if you pull it up directly. And you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok under the same thing. Um, and you can also just, you know, search for me personally on Facebook. I'm not a hard guy to find. 
uh, send me a friend request and uh, or a message. And it, uh, you, I don't know how easy it is for you to put show notes or anything, but anybody's welcome to give me a shout on Facebook or even send me a text on my cell phone if there's anything I can do to help any of you. I'll do my best to do it. Yeah, I'll try to put like a, a screenshot of your uh, YouTube channel on the uh, YouTube on, the, on our YouTube channel when the video airs. All right. And then Seth, who are we gonna have on next week? Oh, you wanna make the announcement? Make the announcement. A, not that many people know who he is, so I don't know if we should say it or not. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna have Courtney Lee on next week. Courtney Lee. Oh wow. Yeah. He's got one <laughs> or two fans out there. And and. Uh, what were you saying about questions, submitting questions to somebody? I know you said you were going to make a post, right? Yeah, I talked to Courtney to make sure he was fine with it, and we're going to put it in the Cleaners Connect group. We're going to put a link where people can uh, leave a voice memo or email us with any questions, and he'll, he's going to, towards the end of the show, kind of answer some of those questions because I know he's probably going to have a lot of questions for him. so be looking out for that. That's awesome. Court, Courtney is really the one that really just completely revolutionized carpet cleaning on YouTube. So, oh, yeah. Kind of a hero yeah. of mine. I love him. I'm looking forward yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. Well, he will be on next week. So, Philip, we really, really appreciate you. And uh, I wish you all the luck. And uh, in the world, I know you're going to do great. And uh, look forward. Maybe I can come down sometime on, and uh, check the rug shop out in person. Yeah, absolutely, man. You're always welcome. Just give us a shout. All right, man. You have a good evening. All right, all right guys. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Right. See ya. Well, we got to stop the video first. There you go. Yeah. I was going to get you to do the tagline, but I couldn't remember what it was. I was afraid you was going to ask me. Never stop learning. That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that went good, man. Over. That went really good. Yeah, it did. 56 minutes. I'm trying to end the video. There we go. You're All still right. recording. Yeah, it finally stopped. So it took like 10 minutes to do the the 20 second video you did. So I imagine this is going to take all night. So I'm just going to let it download and go to bed. Mine still shows this recording. Down in the lower left. <laughs> I don't know. There we go. Nah. Nah. Nope. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it says Paul. I don't know what it's doing. It's be a good blooper. Try and end it. See what happens if I hit the space bar. I just don't want it to mess up, you know, because it won't. Yeah, I don't know why it's not stopping. Does it pause at the top, but I don't know. Record you hit pause and see what it does. Does it do anything? No. It won't let me. Guess because I didn't start it. Hit pause again. <laughs>